First of all, Douglas, what does direct democracy mean for you? It's about pushing power away from Whitehall and putting it in the hands of the individual where possible, the town hall where necessary. Um, we should no longer have key decisions made for us by unelected officials, by remote technocrats, by remote bureaucrats in Brussels or in Whitehall. It's time to put power back in the hands of local people. Do you think that uh, localism is the new catchphrase? Is this, is this the cross-party consensus of the direction we're going Every, now? Everyone now talks the language of localism. They pay lip service to localism. I don't believe that they're really converted to the full-scale change that we need to make. Um, governments um, saying we need to uh, devolve power, they talk about double devolution. The Conservatives have come up with a number of specific proposals to devolve power. Um, but I think there are certain key tests we need to put in place. Um, until a government or an opposition party is committed to actually doing them, then I, I think a lot of it's just talk. But the government recently announced that it was going to cut public sector targets and give more power to uh, to local councils and local NHS. Yeah. Uh, they're going in the same direction that you want to go. Uh, they are talking the talk. I don't think they're actually doing it. When it comes to local government, for me, it's, it's very easy to talk about giving local government more power. Governments of all parties have talked about that for 30 years, and yet the reality has been centralisation. What a government needs to do, if it's serious about localism, is talk about making local government self-financing. Because until government, local government controls its own budgets, it's going to receive its orders from Whitehall. It's going to become a, a, a satellite of central government. Uh, it's, it's about the money. Until we can come up with a coherent proposal to localise control over money, it's all talk. Does the Direct Democracy Group and yourself, um, do you agree that democratic renewal in this country will, will not be effective without electoral reform? I think you need electoral reform, but I'm cautious about some of the models. I think the worst possible thing you could do is adopt a straightforward system of ill-considered PR, because it's about accountability. At the moment, there's no real accountability. It, is it fair to say, I think, that most members of Parliament have seats in Parliament that realistically they're not going to really lose. It doesn't really matter what happens, they're not going to lose their seat. This makes most of our parliamentarians unresponsive. We need a, a, a change to make sure that they become responsive. Now, a party list system of the kind envisaged by most people who advocate electoral reform, I think would make the political classes even less responsive. If we had, for example, state funding of political parties and PR, we would have an almost entirely unaccountable ruling political class in Westminster. By all means, let's consider electoral reform, but let's consider electoral reform that would actually make the politician more accountable. One way I, I think parties can actually deliver this without electoral reform is the use of open primaries. We already have open primaries in the Conservative Party, I should say more accurately open caucuses in the Conservative Party in certain target seats. I, I think if we had open primary selection um, used a lot more um, we would have a far more responsive system, perhaps even open primaries for sitting MPs. Um, if political parties were to accept that then I think one could also start to look at the idea of, of multi-member constituencies. We all accept that competition in, 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 in business is good for the customer. I think a bit of competition in politics would be good for the voter. And um, I'm sure you're aware of the alternative vote system, which is not, doesn't go as far as PR, mm -hmm. but would allow um, um, votes to count more. Mm. Um, would, do you support that system? There's some merit in it. I'm not going to come down and say I support, support that. I, I, with all these systems, the devil is in the detail. And I, I think the status quo is not delivering an accountable system. It is not producing parliamentarians that are fundamentally accountable to the voters. And because of that, more and more people are giving up on the democratic process and not voting. We do need reform, but we have to be very careful. The worst thing in the world we could possibly do is come up with a sort of a Belgian or Italian or, or, or German party list type system that would create a totally unaccountable political class that would be almost totally unaccountable to the voter. 
Um, we, we need to look at how to democratise the selection process, the, the party political system. In the age of YouTube, it's absurd that a small clique of people decide who the candidate is for a particular party. Let's open that process up. Multi-member constituencies used to exist in this country. I believe Harwich, my own constituency, at one time used to return two members of parliament um, to, to Westminster. Um, if you had multi-member constituencies and you had a system of open primary selection within the parties, then I think you would get a very democratically accountable system and one that would produce a working majority, but a working majority of accountable politicians, not of remote politicians more interested in claiming expenses than governing in the interests of the country. Right, and the government's uh, recent Green Paper on constitutional reform is aiming to re-engage the electorate and um, renew faith in politics. Do you think that the Green Paper went far enough? Was there anything that you would have liked to have seen that didn't come up? It was music to my ears when I heard it. And I sat there in the House of Commons and I thought, Gordon Brown has converted to direct democracy. The only problem is in the actual small print. Um, it doesn't go far enough. In fact, it's, it's, I think, on reflection, probably a bit of clever political positioning by Sir Humphrey, not Gordon Brown, by Sir Humphrey and the establishment in Whitehall, who can use this as a way of trying to fend off the demand for greater democracy. I'll give you two very exa specific examples of where it simply doesn't go far enough despite the hype. Number one, it talks about allowing the democratisation of the appointment process for civil servants and judges. Um, it doesn't really do this. Um, we need to have a, a democracy where the key decision makers in the Quangos and the Whitehall bureaucracies can be made democratically accountable to the people we elect. Um, in, the reality is that Gordon Brown's proposals fall far short of that. One or two officials in one or two quangos will be vaguely accountable. But it, it, it's, it's nothing like uh, uh, what we need, which are, are US-style confirmation hearings for pretty much every senior civil servant. Uh, we also need a similar thing for judges, uh, given the power they now wield under, under the uh, uh, human rights legislation. Uh, a second area where I, I, I'm disappointed and don't think it goes far enough is, is it, it does nothing to address the idea of a right of initiative. Um, I have been a Member of Parliament for two years and have had zero say in the legislative agenda. I, like all MPs, can put my name in a hat um, and a man wearing a pair of 19th, 18th century silk tights can draw the name out of the hat and if I'm very lucky, I'm allowed to introduce a private member's bill. And if I'm very lucky, I can talk about something important to my voters for 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes. That's a ludicrous system. We need to democratise it. Why don't we have the Queen's Speech, which is a wonderful uh, occasion, uh, she would read out the ruling administration, the governments, the senior civil servants, legislative wish list. Then she should read out a second speech, the people's bills. Those petitions demanding a second vote on a particular measure, MPs wouldn't have to vote for it, but they would at least start to having uh, start to have to address the issues of concern to the electorate. Um, that's the sort of thing I would have liked to have seen in it. I actually stood up and said to Gordon Brown during the statement, did he envisage a right of initiative? Um, his answer, unfortunately, was no. Um, that's something that, if we're serious about direct democracy, uh, we need to embrace. And finally, a very quick word on the House of Lords. Um, it looks like it will eventually be all or mostly elected. Do you think that will change its powers or its role at all? Um, we certainly shouldn't have people making our law who are not elected by the people expected to live under the law. Um, I'm very pleased that Britain has caught up with the rest of the world 200 years after the United States and uh, several many decades after uh, many other countries and accepted the principle of, of, of democratic lawmakers. Um, I, I'm all in favour of electing um, or having elected people in the Lords. But the thing I'm slightly cautious about is creating a new tier of politician, particularly if it's a new tier of politician off some horrible PR regional list, which would mean another group of politicians. Um, I'd very much like to see local councillors and the heads of local council sitting in the second chamber. They would be elected locally, they would have a democratic mandate, but not one that could challenge the primacy of the Commons. It's what Germany has.